The following is a presentation of the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The Big 12 era has begun, and BYU Cougars football is on the air. Martin finds space to the right. Martin's got a first down and more! The 10, the 5, the touchdown! Shaking off tacklers and taking it in for six. We are two hours away from kickoff, and it's time to get you ready for the matchup with Cougar Pregame Live. Cougar Pregame Live is brought to you by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Cougar Pregame Live is also brought to you by Tucano's Brazilian Grill. Phenomenal flavors, a festive setting, and more fun than you can shake a skewer at. Also by Siegfried and Jensen, helping Utah families for over 30 years. Now, to get you ready for today's game, alongside Hans Olsen, here's your host, Jason Shepard. Good morning, BYU fans. Welcome into Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live. Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Today, the BYU Cougars are deep in the heart of Texas to face the seventh-ranked Texas Longhorns. My name is Jason Shepard. Thank you for joining us for BYU football on this late October Saturday. Joining me from the broadcast booth at Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium is a former Cougar and our radio analyst. He is Hans Olsen. Hello, Hans. How are you today? Man, I couldn't be any better, Shep. Honestly, the weather's perfect. The fans are piling in. They're all around the place, man. BYU has showed up. They definitely have a presence here in Texas. It's been fun kind of hanging out with them, shaking some hands, talking to some people, hearing their optimism. But it's just gorgeous. I wish everybody could see this weather. It's just lightly clouded you got clouds kind of drifting by but you got patches of sun it's a little bit humid but we are in the booth we are overlooking the field and life couldn't be better Shep have you had a chance to get close to Bevo yet have you been up close no are, are you no, planning uh, to do that I, I am definitely I'm looking at Bevo as we speak and all I see is about 14 ribeyes <laughs> A really nice brisket and and maybe a couple of of pot roasts like that that's how i see bevo well it sounds delicious they, they, they don't let me close to him because they know they can see it in my eyes <laughs> it's like the cartoons when the cartoon looks over and a human just turns into a form of a steak mm -hmm. or a, something turns into a steak that's how i see bevo you're just salivating in the broadcast booth looking down at bevo and thinking of all of the the brisket that, uh, that yep. you might be able to smoke. All right, well, let's stop talking about food because, quite frankly, I'm hungry and I don't need this right now. Uh, Hans, BYU did exactly what it needed to do last week. It came out strong. It put pressure on Texas Tech early. Now the level of competition ramps up, but the game plan likely remains the same. What a big opportunity for the Cougars today in Austin. Well, how good did they look against Texas Tech at times, man? It was really nice to see the interior. It was nice to see Nisa Mahe and Jackson Cravens. You know, John Nelson went out of that game with an injury, but they were playing David Latu in the middle. And then you got to see the outsides hold it down too. Tyler Batty was a maniac. That BYU defensive line did the bulk of that work defensively to slow down Taj Brooks and not let him just own the game which then forced it into that freshman's hands, that third string quarterback's hands, and he just couldn't do work with it. So I thought that the defensive game plan was perfect. I thought that the defensive line outperformed, and I thought that that was a really solid win for BYU last week. Well, the offense certainly bounced back from its worst performance of the season at TCU, and I thought that was impressive to see, and they came out determined that they were going to make the TCU game offensively a, a one-game deal. And really, and you talked about BYU's defense slowing down the rushing attack of Texas Tech. Well, it was BYU's offense and its rushing attack that really sort of made an early statement. You had a nice pitch in which L.J. Martin was able to get going, but Aiden Robbins was back, and Aiden Robbins looked good. How big is that for BYU if you can get what we had from L.J. Martin early in the season, you add what we saw out of Aiden Robbins against Texas Tech, is there a chance that all this talk about, well, maybe the run game's just not going to be a thing this year, that maybe, maybe last week was the beginning of the, of the rushing attack showing up? Well, I'm telling you this right now. I'm placing all of my emphasis on Aiden Robbins right now. Aiden Robbins just has to play an incredible game. He, he did. He showed extremely well last week. 
you saw him break some tackles. That 13-yard run on third down to get the first or right there at the marker was spectacular. That was him doing a bulk of the work. I mean, he went through four arm tackles to get that yardage, and he has to be special today. I, I just look at a team like Texas, and, you know, it, L.J. Martin's L.J. Martin, but I look at a guy like Aiden Robbins against a team like Texas, a guy that can power through those arm tackles, a guy that can power through those tackles, he has to be big today. My emphasis is on him in this run game, and he's got to get behind these offensive linemen. And BYU's offensive line, they've got a task in front of them. There's no questions. Alfred Collins, uh, Byron Murphy, Tavondre Sweat, who has a lot of people have been talking about Tavondre Sweat, big 93. He's six foot four, 370 pounds. Shep, he's a big, he, he's basically, basically Bevo in pads. <laughs> he is a big dude out there so this is a really good defensive line BYU's old line's just got to be on top of it but I'm placing heavy emphasis on Aiden Roberts he's got to be good today well the biggest storyline in this game is the fact that Quinn Ewers is not going to be the quarterback and for whatever reason the Cougars are in the midst of three consecutive weeks where they're facing a college quarterback making his first collegiate start. So we know Quinn Ewers is out. He's going to be out a few weeks with an AC joint sprain in his throwing shoulder. Um, Steve Sarkeesian did announce that Malik Murphy is going to get the start. It still remains to be seen if prize recruit Arch Manning is going to see the field today. When I talked with Steve on Thursday, he said he had not made that decision as of yet. Both got work this week, but we do know that Malik Murphy is going to start. BYU, like I said, has has had some practice on preparing for guys where you didn't have a ton of film on. How much does that help, or are we sort of comparing apples and oranges here because backup quarterbacks at Texas are not like the same backup quarterbacks at other schools? Yeah, they're not, and I don't know if you've seen the picture of Malik Murphy, Shep. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to I'm gonna send this tweet out so people can see this. This is Malik Murphy with the uh, quarterback room for Texas, and you've got Arch Manning, and uh, – You've got Quinn Ewers in the picture, and so you've got pretty much the entire quarterback complement. And Malik Murphy is standing there just looking over the top of every one of these dudes (laughs) and looks like a a robot. I mean, he is jacked. In fact, I am tweeting this right now. It, and I want you to look at this, Chef. So for, for those that are, are listening right now, uh, at 975 Hans is is Hans's uh, X account. So let's – oh, my goodness. Yeah, this is yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the same one I saw. Honestly, yeah, this is a, like – this. here's what this is. This is basically a, a, a reenactment of what it's like when you and I are doing pregame out at Cougar Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, First of man, all, we do that's... it shirtless, which is weird. I don't know why we do that. Yeah, but um, well, well, yeah, for the for the fans, for the fans, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. yeah, for the fans. Yeah, yeah. Malik but, Murphy is a big, big guy. Um, yeah, people can go look at that at nine seven five hands. I just tweeted out a picture of him, so you can kind of see what they're up against. So he's a, a true six five, and he's probably more in the two forty ish, two forty five ish range. He's just a big kid. We just have limited reps. Greg Rubel sent out a tweet uh, earlier in the week and talked about how Malik Murphy actually came to the state of Utah as a high school quarterback and played against American Fork. American Fork definitely got the better of of his team, but he put up over 200 yards passing, and he's just a giant of a man. So it's a different task for them today. The two passes that I watched against Houston, one was just a flip to the flats. It wasn't that tough a pass. He made it, and it was okay. The other one was about a 12-yard corner, and he threw it behind the receiver incomplete. So we don't have a big sample size. He's only got eight attempts on the year for 47 yards. We just don't have, and and the other attempts were in pickup minutes. So we don't have a lot of sample size with Malik Murphy's throwing ability. With that said, Shep, I'm not even worried about that at this point. I put that in the back of my mind. I say, all right, if that picks up, then we'll figure that out. But what we've got to absolutely do is focus on Jonathan Brooks. I think that's where the primary focus of this BYU defense is. All right, coming up next, this is the way. Craig Way, the voice of the Longhorns, joins us 
to preview BYU at Texas. This is Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Did you know the... This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Jason Shepard. Welcome back to BYU Cougars in Austin, taking on the seventh-ranked Texas Longhorns. And we're happy to be joined now, Craig Way, the voice of the Texas Longhorns, joining Hans in the booth. I'm back here in Provo. Craig, thanks for taking a few minutes before uh, today's game. We really do appreciate it. Jason, it's my pleasure, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that uh, I first got to meet Hans during Big 12 football media days, and we had a little uh, broadcaster's little uh, happy hour thing, <laughs> and Hans made sure that BYU uh, was was represented, and he had great things to say when we were when we were there at the happy hour. I also ate a bunch of nachos that weren't mine, Craig, and I, and I do apologize if those were yours. There was a, bit, a lot of confusion around about who ordered what, and it was like, it doesn't matter, Hans is eating it. Hans is just like, I'll take some of this, I'll take some of that. Oh. That's right, that's right. I, I thought it was for the table. I, I thought Brian Estridge had, had come in and just ordered a bunch of things for the table. Well, so anytime like, oh, I'm, you can I'm, do I'm... something against Estridge and TCU, you're all right with <laughs> it. I'm just saying. That's good. All right. Hey, uh, yeah, go ahead. Obviously, a uh, beautiful day here i'm just looking at this weather uh, i know you guys had some big rain come in yesterday but this has to seem like uh, perfect weather for texas it's getting close to it i mean we had a game against kansas here last home game 28 days ago and uh, it was very nice it's been a little swampy this week it feels almost like uh, when texas was down at houston last week because of the humidity thing but it's supposed to clear out and be nice comfortable temperatures for this one Craig, let's jump right into the uh, really the biggest storyline of this game, and it's the it's Malik Murphy getting the start today, um, and both he and Arch, according to Coach Sarkeesian, have have had reps throughout the entire week. I don't know if we will see Manning or not. Maybe you can shed some light on that. But just your overall thoughts on on Malik Murphy getting this start and what that probably looks like for Texas today. Well, you're right, Jason, in that it is uh, kind of the headline thing. Now, they've got several guys banged up uh, on the defensive side as well, and that happened last week. There was one point in last week's game against Houston where counting a couple of starters who were, who were ruled out right before kickoff, counting those, there was one point, I think it was in the third quarter, where there were eight starting players out with injury. Now, most have come back. Uh, but there are a couple that are out, and of course the most notable is Quinn Ewers not uh, being available. Malik Murphy is a is a fascinating young man. Uh, it just uh, is a really easygoing kid, uh, a really good competitor. Uh, he has an arm that he can throw it through the South End Zone Club, and he showed that on the one pass he tried to do to Adonai Mitchell last week that went behind him, but then he kind of settled down a little bit. Uh, and he's he is a big kid, but I would not call him a Vince Young type in terms of the danger to run. He's got uh, what uh, what uh, I've heard described as functional mobility as a quarterback, but he's more of a pure pocket passer, really, in the in the Texas offense. So, so Kyle Flood totally trusts Malik's arm. Yes. Okay. Because that was the question I had. Just and more importantly, Sark trusts Malik's arm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah obviously. It's, it's, yeah. And uh, Sark was telling it on the coaches' show this week that every. Friday night when they have a, he has he sits down just him with the quarterbacks all of the quarterbacks and goes through on their call sheet and all this stuff and then he'll ask them what plays do you like best in certain situations and he said I get a myriad of responses from early in the season uh, all the way to now so it's it's a pretty comfortable thing and with Malik Having run with the first-team offense throughout the course of the week, I think there's even a little more comfort there. Hey, really quick, what is the relationship with Kyle Flood and Steve Sarkeesian as far as offensive responsibilities? Well, they're extremely close. Obviously, they worked together on Nick Saban's staff. Yep. And then when Sark got the job, he wanted Flood there. Now, in terms of the play calling, that's all Sark. All I mean, Sark. you know, uh, Flood has the title, but his, his main thing is assembling that offensive line and trying to keep them healthy. They've got one guy. Cole Hudson that they may get back today. He had been rotating a right guard with D.J. Campbell, but Campbell's done a, uh, an admirable job there uh, largely, and the rest of the offensive line is intact 
uh, from from the start. Flood is is really the anchor of a lot of that stuff with what he does with the group. But Sark is the man when it comes to running the place. And Jason, you mentioned about Arch Manning. Uh, he's made a lot of progress. Mm -hmm. Coaches love his work ethic. They love his attitude and approach. I, I will tell you this. This came out very, very early because Arch was an early enrollee that the family, and of course his dad is Cooper, and the, the uncles are Peyton and Eli, obviously, and the, the granddad is Archie. Um, but it was kind of the consensus word that kind of filtered down that the family kind of preferred it if Arch could redshirt. Mm -hmm. And Eli is on record as saying, I was better when I redshirted. Peyton is on record as saying, I wish I could have redshirted. So I think that's the plan. Now, obviously, with this day and age with the rules, you can appear in four ball games. So um, there, there's a chance that we might see him at some point. Uh, uh, so Sark was asked uh, on uh, two days ago at his last media availability if there was a plan to get Arch in the game. He said, we talked about different things, but there is no plan. They don't have a definite plan to say, oh, he's going to go in the fourth series or this or that. They'll kind of play it by ear. Craig, what areas for Texas still need work? If BYU is going to try and capitalize on anything that maybe the Longhorns have struggled with, what would that be? Well, they've gotten beat over the top on some deep balls and, and, and gave up some other. Also, uh, Houston did a really good job after spotting Texas the 21 nothing lead with crossing routes and really hurting them and we know what the Cougars can do with that so it's uh, you know that that was a point of emphasis this week so kind of in the passing game and that secondary is banged up uh, there are a couple of guys who won't be available we don't think today others will be a game time decision on that so I, I think that's where on the opposite side uh, for Texas offensively uh, they've struggled in the red zone and and uh, they, they did a little bit better job with it, at least uh, in the game last week. But uh, in the red zone is an area where the Longhorns have gotten more threes than sevens than they would like uh, in that trade-off. So those are two areas, I think, that need areas, I think, that Sark has emphasized. I know this goes a little bit away from today's game, but I do want to talk just the big scale a little bit. BYU and Texas are about to part ways. Texas now going to the SEC. BYU getting some really nice Big 12 traveling partners with Utah and Colorado, Arizona State, Arizona. I, I, I like the prospects of what the Big 12 is going to be. Craig, how do you feel about Texas and the new home that they're going to be moving into after this season? Well, there is a lot of excitement, obviously. And, and um, you know, I think if, if what has happened with the Big 12 had happened two, three years ago, Texas would probably still in the, be in the Big 12 Conference. Interesting. I, I, Texas and Oklahoma both in meetings uh. with conference officials and athletic directors and presidents made the appeal three, four years ago, we've got to do something, can't stand Pat. And then at the most recent, well, in 2021, at his last Big 12 media days as commissioner, Bob Bowlesby said he did not, exceed, he did not see expansion on the horizon. And... And I think that was the final straw for Texas and, and OU, and six weeks later the deal was done. But they had also told them six months prior they were exploring options. So when, so when uh, you know, Bowlesby said he was blindsided by all this, he wasn't listening because they told him months before they were looking at things because the Big 12 under Bowlesby was incredibly reactionary and not proactive. Now, I think that's flipped. I think Brett Yarmark's doing a fabulous job with the league. I think he'll continue to do that. And Sark said it on a show the other night. He thinks it's, it, it's a great uh, home and destination for his alma mater, and he's very excited about BYU being in the Big 12. Because well, I'd heard that, uh, and, and according to Bowlesby, and I know BYU had made an earlier push or effort to become a part of the Big 12, that Texas and Oklahoma, or at least one or the other, really wasn't in favor of that. But it feels almost like Bowlesby was more the deterrent of the growth of that conference than anybody. It, it, it's not not even a question. Interesting. It's, it's not even a question. And, and for him to say, and you can go back and you can look at it, uh, and it's talked about down here a lot and in other places, when he said in July 2021, expansion is a dead issue. Those were his words. I remember. And, and it was like three weeks later that Texas and Oklahoma made their announcement. Well, then that tells you everything you need. Yeah. So, I, you know, but but again, I will go back to saying what Brett Yormark is doing. 
is what the Big 12 should have been doing six, seven years ago. And you think it could have saved it with Texas? And I think it could have. It, it, it put it this way. There would have been a much better chance of Texas staying and Oklahoma staying had those kinds of proactive moves been made years ago instead of waiting until the horse was out of the barn. I do think the homes for both are going to be great, though. Yeah, and they're, and they're very excited about going to the SEC. There's no doubt. Obviously, there's going to be the regeneration of the rivalry with Texas A&M. There's that and and uh, and Arkansas. It's a it's an odd schedule for Texas next year. They play their three oldest traditional rivals from the past: Texas A&M, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. All the way from Austin. OU game is always in Dallas, but the, the games in College Station and and Fayetteville will be there for them. So they've got those three. Now, they get Georgia and Florida here, which is nice. Uh, And then I think Kentucky's coming here, and they also go to Vanderbilt. They go to Nashville. But it's going to be a, a new frontier, no doubt. Craig, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. We appreciate it. it. Should be a fun one. And then you obviously we, we didn't really get into it a whole lot, but you know you have the the nice little story with with Sark and his connections to BYU. I still maintain, and I've said this on air and off to anybody who'll listen to me. I still think Steve Sarkeesian is the most underrated quarterback BYU has ever had. So that's a nice little fun storyline for today. We really do appreciate you taking a few minutes and have a great call today. Hey, I appreciate. It. I'll leave you with this. Okay. Sark actually said on the coaches show the other night. That he came this close, you could take your index finger and thumb to FaceTiming Kalani Sataki. What when they got out of some meetings, he said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna FaceTime." And he said, "Then I realized as I started to pull it up, all of our play stuff was behind us on the whiteboard." <laughs> and he said, "I better not do that." So that's why he didn't do it. But that also tells you how close those two yeah, are. Yeah, they they are. And Kalani said that all week long, just how much that relationship has meant to him. Uh, certainly, should be a fun one today. And and again, thanks for the time and have a great call today. My pleasure, Jason. Thank you. There we go. Craig Way, the voice of the Texas Longhorns. Coming up next, young linebackers are making a name for themselves, and Hans Olsen will break it down in X's and Olsen. You're listening to the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Tune to Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Jason Shepard. Let's pause 10, say, 10 seconds for station identification. You're listening to BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is BYU Radio on KBYU FM HD2 Provo. You're listening to BYU Football on BYU Radio. Welcome back to Cougar Pregame Live. It's brought to you by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Jason Shepard in Provo, Hans Olsen at Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium. And Hans, your X's and Olsen segment today is going to focus on the linebacker position, one that has seen the loss of Ben Bywater for the season. And losing a guy like that is never good, but but you've been impressed with what you've seen from the guys who stepped into that role, haven't you? Yeah, I have. I think that Harrison Taggart, who is kind of a long story, kid out of Utah, ended up in Oregon, goes on a mission, comes back. BYU ends up being able to put him over to the BYU side of things. And Harrison Taggart has come along. He really has, and he looks good. And he's just a different type of linebacker than Ciala Isera. I believe those are two very unique, very different types of linebackers. Ciala Isera is very good at taking on blocks. So he'll take on an offensive lineman at the point. He'll get aggressive. He'll shed the block, and he'll make a tackle. Harrison Taggart is good in coverage. Harrison Taggart's really good at getting from the hash over to the numbers to try to make a tackle. So they're both unique and both diverse, but both are filling in really well right now for a Ben Bywater. And Ciali Acer, I think today, has to have himself a fantastic game. In order for these guys to be in this game against Texas, you're going to have to have <clears throat> Jackson Cravens, Nice Amahe, Tyler Batty, Isaiah Banya, and others fill their gaps and do their role. You've got to have really good tacklers in that second line of defense to clean it up. A.J. Bonkpachan, Harrison Taggart, uh, Ciali Acera, Max Tooley. These guys all have to be right there to take on those tackle or those uh, guard blocks, get off those blocks, and be able to make the tackle. And, and I think that Ciali Acera is very good at doing that. 
Well, and from the linebacker position, I, I realize that the majority of the interceptions, and we really haven't touched on the takeaways and just how good BYU is at that. I know it's certainly on Texas's mind that they can't turn the ball over today, and if you're BYU, you're certainly hoping that you're forcing turnovers again, and maybe you can get scores from your defense too. That would be fantastic. But even though most of the INTs and that type of thing have come from the corners, I think how BYU's linebackers play the pass today could play a big role in that as well. I think it could. I absolutely think that could. You know, BYU is going to be a downhill run read first. Should be all game long. So after their run reads, they're going to have to get into their different pass responsibilities, their pass coverage responsibilities. They're just going to have to be really good, Shep, of their run recognition. You know, linebackers all have keys, and their keys are different, and they can differ week to week. And when they see their key, their key tells them if it's a run or pass. And they have to read it and get into a run lane or they got to read it and get into their pass coverage really quickly because Jonathan Brooks will take advantage of you if you're trying to read pass. You're dropped back just two yards, three yards, and on your heels, your heels, that's where Jonathan Brooks really takes advantage of you. All right, up next, what does Connor Pay attribute last week's increase in the run game to, and is it sustainable? Find out in Shep Talk after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Jason Shepard. Welcome back, BYU at number seven, Texas. Now, Connor Pay has been a fixture on the offensive line. He started at center the past two seasons, but the first five games of the year, he started at right guard. For the past two games, however, he's been back at center. The junior from Highland is this week's subject of Shep Talk, and I asked him how much more fun this week's practice has been as opposed to last week coming off the TCU loss. I mean, it's always nice coming off of a win, but it's business as usual. Practice has been the same, same grind, same physicality. You know, it's obviously, you know, it's just nicer to, you know, <laughs> knowing that you came off a win the week before. So where does that consistency and maybe not getting too high or too low come from? Is that start with the coaches? Is that a player thing? Where, do, where does that come from? I think I think it comes from the top down. I think it starts with Kalani, you know, and that's the culture and that's the program that he's built over his years here where, you know, words you know, try to stay play at a high level and just stay at that high level, yeah. not get too high or drop down too low. Um, and so I think that comes from the top. That comes from him. The win over Texas Tech, the, the offense obviously got back on track after the TCU loss. What was working so well for you, or, or maybe in your opinion, what was different about that game versus the week before? You know, obviously the, the guys came out with a chip on their shoulder just because of the embarrassment the week before, you know, having something to prove. And then, and so I think that high level of energy to start the game, you know, helped us get off to a fast start. It was nice to be able to establish a run game a little better. Uh, you know, anytime you can have five yards of carry, that's a good game uh, on the ground. Obviously we need to perform better in the second half and, you know, maintain that momentum and that consistency we were talking about throughout all four quarters. And so that's something we're working towards. When you look at the opportunity ahead of you guys this week, number one, it's a top 10 team, but being able to go to Texas, a place BYU has not played in almost 10 years, how do you look at this opportunity? This this is a big game, right? Yeah, no, we're really excited. Couldn't be more pumped to go play. Anytime you get a chance to go play, you know, a top 10 team, it's a, it's a great opportunity to go and, you know, prove that you belong. As a competitor, you want to play the best. You know, that's just, that's what you want. And so we're, we're fired up to be able to go down and play Texas you know we we respect the hell out of them they're a really good team how do you prepare yourself for over a hundred thousand fans how, how can you replicate that in terms of knowing what to expect um I mean I don't know if you can necessarily replicate it fully but the nice thing is that once you get between the lines every field's the same yeah I mean obviously you know you, you do the crowd noise and we have the speakers out at practice and a lot of times they're a lot louder out here than they are at the stadium because they set these giant speakers right behind your head <laughs> like five yards behind you and so um, you know we have experience with it before Oregon last year was very loud Arkansas was loud and so you know we have experience with it you know obviously it's gonna be really fun to play in an environment like that so. Let's talk about you specifically. How has this season gone for you, do you think? 
good. You know, it's been interesting, you know, starting at right guard for the first five games and then, you know, moving back to center. And so, but but it's been good. I've, I've enjoyed it and I'm just enjoying the process and, you know, the, the process of improvement yeah. that needs to continue to happen. And it's been, this is a resilient team. Yeah. And with the exception of that TCU game, we've responded to adversity very well throughout the season. And it's fun to be a part of that. I'm just glad I get to be here and just get to, get to go through this inaugural season with my uh, with my teammates. Look, there are some obvious differences that everybody can obviously see. For you, what's the biggest difference in playing right guard and center? How much of a difference is it for you personally? It's a huge difference, actually. And I think that's a pretty common misconception for people like oh he could slide down to oh he played right next to it no the every position on offensive line from tackle to guard to center is very different from the other your timing completely changes your angles change you know it takes a little bit of an adjustment and it was a little bit nicer for me where I was playing both throughout all of training camp and so moving moving back to center because I had a lot of those reps it would have been a lot harder if I had been playing straight right guard all through fall camp all through those first five games and then moving back it probably would have taken me a week yeah. or two to get that timing down that muscle memory because those those movements are so specific at every position it is it's really challenging but thankfully I had those reps so I feel like I was able to get back to it pretty quick and just trying to build on getting better every week so obviously I'm looking big picture here but is a benefit of playing those two positions regardless of how you project at the next level is it still good for you to be able to have have those reps on tape no doubt i think because the way the the nfl has moved you know especially with you know they carry seven all linemen maybe yeah. most teams maybe eight yeah they don't carry any more than that so they have their starting five usually a swing tackle or two tackles even and then someone who can play all three interior positions you know that's kind of just how how it works it's kind of how they have to do it with how constricted the rosters are and so i think in the long run it'll be a benefit for me i do think center is probably my more natural position mm-hmm. But I think that also probably just comes with how many more games I've sure. played there. I don't know. I feel pretty comfortable at guard, too. But I think uh, I think it'll definitely play a factor, at least in some way, at the next level. I think it'll only help me knowing or having the team know that I, that I can play both or all three or whatever they need me to do. All right, Connor, let's wrap it up with the final four questions. Right. Your favorite flavor of ice cream and the last time you ate it. My favorite flavor of ice cream is probably... Oreo ice cream. Okay. As that is probably the most popular response, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure it's because it's awesome. <laughs> the last time I ate it, probably like two weeks ago, okay. I had some at like a family event, I think is the last time. Uh, dog person or cat person? Dog, for sure. Cats suck so bad. <laughs> Cats are pointless animals. <laughs> A dog is your friend. A cat doesn't even want to look at you. They, they're terrifying, and they just are just nuisances. They just scratch you, and they're mean. I don't know why anybody would ever want a cat. All right. Uh, you're only allowed to sign up for one streaming service. There's so many out there, but you can only sign up for one. Which one are you picking? HBO Max. Any particular show because of that? No, but I, I feel like they had they have all like the blockbuster mm-hmm. movies on there where it's like Netflix will have it for like two weeks yeah. and then it's gone. I feel like HBO has all the major ones. So okay, last question: yeah. What does it mean to you to be a part of BYU's first P5 season in the Big 12? I mean, it's really special. Obviously, just being around BYU my whole life. My dad played here, you know, during the Lavelle years, and so I kind of have at least a, a vague perspective on how the program's grown over the last three or four decades, kind of culminating to this season and this chance to move into a, a Power 5 conference, or I guess Power 4 now, but or soon to be, which is probably where college football is going to move here pretty soon anyways, yeah. where it'll be dominated by the conferences. I, I bet the NCAA doesn't exist in the next few years would be my guess and so the fact that we got in now puts us in a good position for when when that takes place you know just the opportunity to play for a conference championship and now with the college football playoff moving to 12 teams now a chance to compete for a national championship realistically every season you know and so that's that's a special thing to be able to kind of be a part of this first team that moves BYU into that into that phase of their history so it's a really special thing that we definitely don't take for granted (laughs) Connor, appreciate you doing this. You did a great job, and good luck in Austin. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was Connor Pay, BYU Center, right now. And uh, I thought it was an interesting conversation just uh, in terms of the next level for him. And and he knew exactly what NFL rosters – you know, look for and how they break down the number of guys they bring in at that position. I thought that was really interesting. And, you know, the fact that he has, you know, 
an opportunity to, to put on tape for NFL scouts, him playing at right guard and obviously playing at center. That's, uh, that's certainly something that can benefit him long term. All right, coming up next, we'll check in on number six, Oklahoma at Kansas, as well as the rest of the day in the Big 12. You're tuned into Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's Jason Shepard. Mountain America Credit Union, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Welcome back into the program. It's time for the Big 12 Blitz. And we're going to start, Hans, with a pretty good game in Lawrence. Things are looking pretty good for the, the hometown Jayhawks. Uh, but the last couple of minutes have not gone the way of KU. Number six, Oklahoma, has a 20-14 to lead at Kansas. At one point, the Jayhawks were up 14-7. to Oklahoma tied the game up, so it was 14-14 on the ensuing uh, kickoff. The Kansas kick returner uh, muffed it, went right through his hands. Oklahoma was able to recover the fumble, and they just put it in the end zone for the touchdown. So they lead 21 21- to 14 and uh, Oklahoma at least for right now and it's still it's very early Hans 423 to go in the second quarter but um, Kansas putting up a little bit of a fight and some mistakes now having trailing by a touchdown well you know I'm all about the weather delays I'd love it you know me Greg you everybody kind of filling in doing our thing I love weather delays Uh, I don't think it was good for Kansas this thing turned into an hour weather delay for Kansas and Oklahoma went in for a bit probably sat down looked at the white barred board figured some things out that kansas was doing and they've come out of that weather delay on fire so probably not good for kansas but a nice initial push i expect oklahoma to close this thing out well and and the thing that i'm just in amazement about with kansas is jason bean got the start again at quarterback jalen daniels has not played a football game since byu lost in lawrence you know several weeks ago and uh, the, the injury he's dealing with is just not getting better, and, and Jason Bean right now is the quarterback for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and it makes, makes it really tough for Kansas, and a team that was showing really well. That yeah. second half against BYU, they looked so good. Their yep. offense really started a motor. And so definitely a big blow for them to not be able to get Daniels back. Well, a, a week after Houston made things real difficult on Texas, they are getting worked in Manhattan. K-State leading Houston 28 to nothing. And there's still 5.23 to go in the third quarter. K-State now 5-2 and two overall, looking to go 6-2, and two, and also looking to improve to 4-1 and one in the Big 12. K-State's uh, starting to get into a nice little rhythm right now. Well, that Texas-Houston game came down to Houston's ability to throw. Donovan Smith went for nearly 400 yards. He was tossing it all over the yard. And they just don't have a run game that they can lean on. And I think that's their downfall. They had like 14 yards rushing against Texas last week. They just can't rush the ball. They're too one-dimensional. And it just shows one-dimensional teams are going to get snuffed out. And I think that Kansas State is doing a really good job of trying to force Houston into some things in the passing game, uh, running a lot of good coverages. And I think Kansas State's really good on their back end defensively. Well, next week's opponent for BYU is West Virginia, so uh, Cougar fans probably paying a bit of attention to West Virginia's game in Orlando. Uh, UCF still looking for its first Big 12 victory. Uh, 0-4 is the Knights' record, and they trail uh, 24-21. Mountaineers have a three-point advantage uh, about halfway through the third quarter. Uh, West Virginia has, uh, I don't know, come down to earth a little bit, but still... Uh, a very dangerous team, and right now with a three-point lead in the uh, in the game right before they uh, they host BYU next week. Well, I know we're going to talk a lot about Garrett Green next week, but he is a dual-threat quarterback. He can run. He is very powerful, and he's also got a strong arm. He can move it around the field well, too. So Garrett Green right now is combining for about 200 yards, 136 through the air and 45 on the ground in seven carries and he's got two rushing touchdowns on the day Shep so when we get ready for BYU West Virginia we're going to be talking about Garrett Green's ability to run the ball and do things in the passing game as well he's definitely a durable 
two-way threat type quarterback. Yeah, no question about that. He will be a topic of discussion coming up next week. All right, the other games that uh, that will get underway a little bit later on, in fact, uh, will kick off the exact same time as our game in Austin, Iowa State. Uh, will be in Waco to take on Baylor. And then at 6 o'clock Mountain Time, Oklahoma State, which has, is now 3-1 and one in the Big 12. They did not have a great start, but uh, since conference play has begun, uh, they have played much better. They are hosting Cincinnati, who is also looking for uh, their first conference uh, victory. So that game again tipping off at 6 o'clock. That is your Big 12 Blitz coming up next. We will visit with The Voice. Some uh, some updated news on BYU's running back situation. We'll get that from Greg Rubel next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Let's get you back to Jason Shepard and Hans Olsen for more Cougar Pregame Live. Brought to you by Mountain America. On the new skin, BYU Sports Network. It's a big one today for the Cougars in Austin, Texas, taking on number seven, Texas. It's at Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium. That is where the voice of the Cougars joins us. Jason Shepard in Provo, Hans Olsen in the broadcast booth, now joined by Greg Rubel. Hello, Greg. The last time you were there, things went pretty well for the Cougars. Yes, it was Taysom time. <laughs> and uh, if you're talking about that one, yes, uh, 2014, of course, so women's soccer was just here a few weeks ago, just behind us here, and uh, got a W that night too. So uh, Austin has been good to BYU of late. Yeah, there's uh, there's no question about that. Um, let's let's start with some uh, some news that uh, that you put out on uh, the social media a little bit. Uh, it was good to see the socials. Yes, it was good to get Aiden Robbins back last week. Looked really good. And now it's looking like having him back is more of a necessity because the Cougars may be without a different running back today. What do you, what do you know? Yeah, BYU has one guy with more than 78 yards rushing this year, and that one guy, L.J. Martin, is unlikely to play today. Uh, Kalani telling us in our pregame that he's going to give it a maybe, – maybe put him out there in pregame, see how it goes. But he said it doesn't look good. He said that uh, there might be more of a risk of, of exacerbating an injury if he were to go today, but they'll um, they'll call him a game time decision. But uh, he said it doesn't look good for LJ to be available. So that's 438 rushing yards that you don't have access to. That brings you down to Aiden Robbins and 78 on three yards a carry. And and the good news is he looked better last week. Again, the yards per carry number wasn't much better, but he ran better and had a third and 13 run of 13 to kind of ice the game late. So. I thought the signs were encouraging about Aiden Robbins, but it's up to Aiden Robbins, Deion Smith, and Miles Davis now to uh, carry the load for BYU on the ground if LJ can't go. And it looks like LJ won't be able to go today. So uh, a great disparity then in production as uh, Texas will start Jonathan Brooks. 825 rushing yards on 6.4 yards per carry. So considering that Brooks has 825, BYU has, four, has, has 555 on the season, minus 438. Uh, there, there's just a, it's it's a, you know it's a wide disparity in terms of what each team can expect from its ground game. And then C.J. Baxter's not too bad either. He has a couple of rushing touchdowns. Savion Red has a rushing touchdown. Uh, Texas running backs are deep and talented. And uh, yet another week, Jason, where you take on a, one of the best running backs in the country. Uh, the Big 12 is a good offensive league historically. Uh, quarterbacks garner a lot of the attention, but the running backs have been excellent. And uh, another one coming BYU's way today in Jonathan Brooks. And again, Aiden Robbins, signs were encouraging last week. We'll see how he'll do with a, a heavier workload. He had 16 carries last week, though. It was a pretty good load to begin with, but he'll have to be up around you know, 20 to 25 and hopefully gaining some positive yardage for BYU in this one. What else, uh, any other personnel news and notes that you discussed with Kalani uh, before we move on to yeah, some other Keanu things? Yeah, it's been a rough season for Keanu Hill. He's kind of in and out and another game out for, for Keanu today. So uh, Cody Epps is being incorporated back into the offense, and he uh, had a number of grabs last week, but uh, Keanu Hill will not be able to play today back in his home state. Uh, the Cougs are looking to see how the offensive line shakes out. We'll see in pregame uh, how Paul Miley looks. Uh, Paul Miley is maybe maybe a bit of a question mark coming into today. Uh, if he were not able to go, you'd go Suamataia, Lapuaho, Pei, Etienne, and Kaim across the front. 
with Ian Fitzgerald, the next guy in. But they'll uh, run Paul out in pregame, I'm sure, and see how he appears to, to, to look. Um, that's the one question mark I'd have for BYU on the O-line. Defensively, uh, no John Nelson, so BYU down a body on the D-line. Uh, still no Marcus McKenzie, so you won't see him on punt gunner. Likely his spot taken by Maury Bamba on those special teams. Safeties are pretty locked in right now with Slade and Wakeley starting and Rex and Damuni backing up. You get Isaiah Glasker back at linebacker, so to provide some linebacker depth along with Von Chapon, Acera, Thule, Taggart, uh, Gasker comes, uh, Glasker comes back, Ace Kafusi's in the mix along with Moa and Hanneman that gets you much deeper down the linebacker. One thing about Texas though, and Hans can kind of chime in on this too, Texas is deep in terms of talented guys but when they when they have a position they like they don't mess with it they they, they'll they'll play those top two linebackers a lot of snaps talking about Ford and Bender right now and and beyond that they'll use a lot of guys in different spots but it's a pretty concentrated group of guys they don't have to spread it out too deeply um, to to get a lot of good guys on the field but they do use their depth don't they Greg I mean they rotate those defensive linemen defensive line in particular is where you see a lot of rotation yeah you'll move a lot through the jack position a lot through the star position and those guys have all kinds of varying responsibilities, Shep. They'll drop into coverage. They'll definitely blitz. They'll get off the edge. They take on man responsibility. Oftentimes, they'll be responsible for Isaac Rex. And that's one area that Houston really took advantage of Texas. Houston got a bulk of their passing yards by finding the jack or the star coverage and throwing it in the middle of the field. So I would hope that BYU could do the same. But, uh, Greg, you were telling me that you know, when it comes to this defensive coordinator, Pete Krakowski, yeah. th- th- this is one of the better in the country. Yeah, he's uh, he's somebody that BYU's seen, uh, Jason, and, and audience for a few years now. Uh, back in the day, 90s, he was a Boise State linebacker, and he was a Boise State D coordinator, coordinator at UW. And so BYU saw his defenses in Boise. He saw his defense uh, with Washington, and now they're seeing him with Texas, and he is among the very best there is. And it helps when you have Texas-type talent to go with your scheme. Yeah. But his schemes are very good, very innovative, and, uh, and again, it's, it's not, not much of a stretch to say it's one of the best B- best DCs that BYU's ever had to face. And so Pete, Kwiatkow- Pete Kwiatkowski's defense is stout and very versatile. Hands alluded to it, but uh, you'll see a guy looking like a safety on, on one down, and then he's, he's got his hand on the ground on the next and, and coming off the edge. Well, it's going to be interesting because what TCU did defensively was off the page, off the format, a little bit more difficult for Slovis to read. And I wonder how much Pete Kwiatkowski looked at different coverages and different man responsibilities and how much he'll try to map that because TCU seemed to cause this BYU offense more problems than anybody else they've seen this season. And we'll see if Pete Kukowski's got some type of formula that he brings to the field with. Yeah, BYU's formula has to be get something happening on the perimeter. Uh, don't take too many losses of yardage in the run game and hope to hit some shots. And, and an early lead would be helpful. BYU's been a really good front-running team under Kalani. And, um, you know, certainly you have to avoid the kinds of starts that uh, hamstrung BYU both to begin the game in Fort Worth and to begin the second half in Kansas. In that KU game, BYU had in control for 30 minutes, right? And and they got the ball back to begin half number two, and the game swung on the pick six. So the game swung on the pick six at Kansas, and you could argue, although it was the first series of the game, uh, that the game may have swung on the first series in Fort Worth with the pick six. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, That really gets things started off the right way. But, you know, Greg, you were talking about the running back situation. I did want to mention this. Without L.J. Martin on the field, Aiden Robbins has to take the bulk of the carries, but Miles Davis has to be that perimeter guy that you just mentioned, talking about hitting the perimeter. He's got to hit some of that perimeter. That's not that's not Aiden Robbins' best attribute. Miles Davis is really good at that. And then you've got to rotate Deion Smith in in your reception category for the running backs because Deion Smith has been one of your most reliable receiving running backs so far this season with five catches and 62 yards and a touchdown. And without L.J. Martin, uh, the best yards per carry guy becomes Miles Davis. Only 14 uh, carries, but for 64 yards and a long of 11. So uh, that's one of the areas BYU have to find something today to try to uh, narrow the gap between what the Cougars have and what Jonathan Brooks brings, because he brings a lot. Greg, one last thing before I I let both of you go. Um, One of the cool parts of today's game is the storyline and connections with Steve Sarkeesian. And, and I mm-hmm. I want people to, to realize um, just how much he still holds his alma mater in high regard. He does not do interviews with opposing media. Um, you can imagine when you're in that type of situation, the, the amount of media requests you get 
just overwhelmingly. So he just doesn't do that in general. Uh, but he made an exception for BYU, and people are going to be able to hear that conversation that I had with Sark in about uh, about 12 minutes from now. What do you remember about Steve Sarkeesian, the BYU quarterback? Well, it was such, a, such an interesting way in which he came to BYU because his uh, John Walsh's decision to leave after his junior year and his connection with Steve Sarkeesian really gave BYU a quick in to getting Steve right in the footsteps of John Walsh. And so it happened pretty quickly. People forget that uh, Steve Sarkeesian was also a USC baseball player back in the day. Uh, he was a really good athlete and someone that had no real natural ties to BYU, but enough connections um, that when John Walsh decided he was going to go, Steve made perfect sense. And just how immediately incorporated he was into Lavelle and Norm's style and what he was able to bring to BYU and, and uh, his, his personality. Um, he says now, uh, this week of the BYU week, he's been watching so much old video of himself, and he says, I don't know, I don't know if, I would if I would recruit myself <laughs> based on what I saw on film with how you know, he, he kind of his attitude on the field. But it certainly worked in BYU's favor. And one of the things I remember most about Steve actually came after he left BYU. Uh, he was a professional quarterback for the CFL's Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And, uh, and that's, uh, I grew up in the province of Saskatchewan, and I, I had a talk show on KSL Radio back in the day around those times, and I was able to connect with Steve Sarkeesian from Saskatchewan as a, as a Rough Riders quarterback and have him on my show as a guest, and he was as good to work with then as he was as a BYU quarterback, and as you found out, Jason, as good to talk to now here as Texas' head coach years later because of the affinity he has for BYU. So nothing but positive and fond memories about Steve and his interactions and his uh, uh, the way he treated media, the way he, uh, he dealt with me after he left BYU, and uh, just uh, so happy to see the success he's had for, for so many years now. Yeah, no question about it. Guys, uh, we'll, let, uh, we'll let you both go. Uh, appreciate the insight and, uh, and the conversation, and uh, we'll hear you guys coming up in about a half an hour. Thanks, Jeff. There we go. That's Greg Rubel and Hans Olsen. Mitchell Jurgens will join me on the other side. We're coming right back. This is the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The seventh-ranked Texas Longhorns, and I'm joined now by our sideline reporter, Mitchell Jurgens. Mitchell, how are you today? Hey, doing great. This is uh, this burn orange country. It's pretty. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. I mean, I've I've come to a couple games here, but played actually here in 2014 and. Dude, it's something special. I love it. Yeah, what do you remember from that game? I, I, I know what I remember from that game. What do you remember from that game? <laughs> uh, so the I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, this was game two on the schedule. Is that right? It was played at UConn, I think, the first game, and then uh, I'm pretty sure Texas was game two. That sounds um, right. This was, this was my second game ever dressing, and I remember being back on punt return in front of 100-plus thousand people thinking like what the heck am I doing here um it was it was nuts but it's I mean so cool growing up here in Texas it's it's everyone's dream even if you didn't grow up in Texas to play here um you know against against the Longhorns so it was a uh, pre pretty special and definitely memorable what was the biggest difference you saw in the BYU offense last week that wasn't there two weeks prior at TCU yeah yeah a couple things first uh, the offensive line took a significant step forward um, they were dominant, and, and I believe won the line of scrimmage offensively, which I don't know if they've done all season. Um, to put up 150 rushing yards, averaging, uh, I want to say, around five yards a carry, um, you know, and we're seeing a healthy Aiden Robbins. The run game took off, and, and we haven't seen that um, all season, so that was crucial. Um, but then the second thing is the BYU secondary. They, they showed up and played incredibly. Now, you know, could it have been the result of a third-string quarterback um, you know, not comfortable back there making his first start. Potentially, it could have played a little bit into it. But overall, I mean, this, those DBs stepped up. They played with aggression. You heard Jacob Robinson um, in the post game last week talked about against TCU. Just mentally, he didn't feel like he was there. Um, but uh, last week against Texas Tech, something switched, and they all played with a ton of aggression. Um, they they made plays, every single one of them, forcing turnovers, getting involved in a turnover with Crew Wakely tipping that ball up. I mean, it was they played exceptionally well, um, and that proved to be, uh, I think, obviously a big difference maker in the game, forcing a bunch of turnovers. Um, and so, uh, you know, if they can replicate that uh, from last week, I, I mean, I think you've got a, a decent chance to compete and, you know, potentially come away with an upset win. As a former receiver yourself, we know that Malik Murphy's going to get the start. Don't know if 
Arch Manning's going to play. But regardless, uh, the receivers for Texas are going to have to make adjustments. What are what are the challenges today for the Longhorn receivers who are likely going to have to adjust to certainly one quarterback, but possibly two quarterbacks? What, what can BYU's defense do to possibly take advantage of that situation? Yeah, so, so I mean, the biggest challenge is just going to be the chemistry between the quarterback and the pass catchers. Um, you, look at, you look at Quinn Ewers, I mean, he's been the guy for a while, and my guess is a lot of those starters uh, and, and the people competing, uh, by the way, if you heard that, that was the... the Smoky the cannon just went off, and that thing is loud. <laughs> yes, it is um, loud, yes. <laughs> um, but the, the chemistry, like the, these starters, uh, the pass catchers, the ones that are playing, my guess is they haven't gotten a lot of reps with either of these uh, two quarterbacks playing today, uh, potentially because um, they're freshmen. They haven't had a lot of time. Um, and so that chemistry, you could see timing be off. You could see, you know, not being on the same page, whether to settle in a, in a first window or a second window against zone coverage, um, a back shoulder ball versus a ball over the top. I mean, all that can be, um, it can be something to get used to, and it takes time to build that chemistry. Um, with that said, you know, Malik, uh, Murphy, he's got a cannon. Uh, so we've heard he's, I mean, he's a, it was an incredible recruit coming out of high school. Um, he's got uh, incredible arm talent. And then the pass catchers for the Longhorns, they're uh, incredibly athletic, fast. They're good. And so this is, it doesn't mean that BYU's got, a, you know, a huge advantage here. They've, they're going to have to uh, compete. Um, but, you know, to the second part of your question, what can BYU do to take advantage? Again, they have to make these quarterbacks feel uncomfortable. Being in a first start in a game where they're going like, to get potentially a lot more snaps than they have ever had before, um, make them more uncomfortable than they already are, bring some pressure, um, get them, you know, out of the pocket, get them, um, you know, just, just put a bunch of pressure on to make their job as challenging as possible. And if, if the DBs play as well as they did and they can stay locked in coverage, and I think it could be a pretty challenging matchup for those quarterbacks. All right, what's your marquee matchup or your key for a BYU upset victory today? Yeah, you, you got to win the turnover margin. Uh, BYU is proving to be one of the best in the country at this, and uh, this is the reason why BYU has a 5-2 and two record today. Uh, and they can take advantage with two new quarterbacks, potentially, um, for the Longhorns. Um, you know, the, with, with new guys back there, they're going to be more prone to potentially make some mistakes. And if BYU can capitalize, I think that's going to be a huge difference maker. On the offensive side, Keaton needs to protect the ball. Um, you know, sustain drives, move the ball down the field. If he can protect it, uh, you know, there's going to be drives where they're not going to put up points, but don't turn the ball over to give the Longhorns a short field. We have... Uh, you know, BYU has an incredible weapon in Ryan Rico to be able to flip the field, make Texas go the length of it. Um, if, you know, if BYU isn't going to be able to put points um, or, or finish with points after a drive. So rely on that. Don't make mistakes, uh, you know, dumb mistakes uh, from that quarterback position in Keen Slovis. If he can take care of the football and the BYU can first force some turnovers, um, this could be, again, the, the key to, to a BYU victory. All right, Mitch, thanks for the, your, uh, your insight as always. At some point during the broadcast the, this afternoon, though, I would like to see if you could get an interview, uh, a one-on-one -on -one with Bevo. Now, you may have to do most of the talking, <laughs> but I think that could go a long way. That could be fun. Yeah, I'll see what I can do. All right, we'll see what you can do. Thanks, Mitch. Great stuff. All right. Yeah, All right. thanks, Jason. You bet. On the other side, my exclusive interview with Steve Sarkeesian. We talk about being a part of the BYU quarterback fraternity, today's matchup with the Cougars, and how his time in Provo helped him along his coaching journey. That's next on Mountain America Credit Union Cougar pregame live on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Tune to Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Jason Shepard. BYU at number seven, Texas. It's coming your way in about 45 minutes. As someone who watched him play when he was at BYU, it was an absolute thrill to get the chance to talk with Steve Sarkeesian this week. And he does not do opposing media, but he was willing to do this for BYU. And that says a lot about how he feels about BYU and his time in Provo. Here's my conversation with former Cougar quarterback and the head coach of the Texas Longhorns, Steve Sarkeesian. 
Coach, for obvious reasons, you've been asked a lot about your BYU days this week, and it's really been fun to hear you talk about those days and the influence that it's had on you. At the time, what did it mean to you, but certainly now removed from your playing days, what does it mean to you to be a part of a quarterback fraternity like BYU? Yeah, you know, when I uh, when I chose to go to BYU, I, I was going as a junior college transfer that I knew they threw the ball and and I, I knew the history of BYU of throwing the ball, but but I don't know if I really understood quite enough what the impact of the being the quarterback at BYU in that era was. And when I got there, some phenomenal moments early in my career. Um, but I also remember throwing three picks against Utah in the first half, my, my junior year and the booze coming down. I'm like, Oh, this is, they're really, really serious, you know? And what, what it did for me in my time was talk about getting recommitted and recommitted to your team. I, I felt like that's what made us a special team. My senior year guys like Chad Lewis, Itula Mealy, Mark Atawaya, um, you know, the, the Ross brothers, um, Shay Muirbrook, um, th there were some awesome, awesome players, Kaipo McGuire, that we really kind of came together, Tim McTire, and, and that spurned me now of why important the team aspect is what it is. You know, we had a lot of talented players my junior year, uh, but my senior year, I think we played – more as a team and in all three phases, James Dye was a great kick returner that all three phases really came together. And so as much as assuming the responsibility of being the quarterback to throw passes in that offense, it was assuming the responsibility of being a leader and connecting people. And I think that was something that I've always carried with me. And it now more than ever as a head coach here at the university of Texas. Let's stay with the quarterback theme, and it's kind of crazy. BYU's on a run of facing backup quarterbacks right now. This will mark three games in a row where they've faced a quarterback making his collegiate start. You announced on, on Thursday that Malik Murphy will get the start against BYU. Arch Manning may see some time. You haven't made that decision yet. How much does the offense change without Quinn as the quarterback? systematically we won't we won't change you know um you know what we try to do uh, i think like most coaches try to do is we try to you know put our put our quarterback in the in the best position to be successful and that's identifying his strengths and weaknesses and the things that he runs well in practice that he is a comfortable a comfort level with and so we're going to run our offense and and we're, we're going to we're going to do it to best try to attack what BYU does which is which is obviously a, a a tall task that way but but we also have to be mindful of Malik and what does he do well and so there may be some things that he does a little bit differently or or better than Quinn for that matter and there may be some things that he doesn't do quite as well as Quinn and so those are the decisions we try to make throughout the week um, so that we can devise a, a good plan to put him in position to be successful. You are very familiar with the guys in charge on the other sideline and what they like to do. What has stood out to you about this 5-2 and two Cougar team coming to Austin? Tough, hard nose. Um, I, I feel like I'm watching Kalani. You know, I, I, and I've known Kalani a long, long time. Um, these guys are full of energy. You can see the way they play. Uh, they're, they're full of energy. They're attacking style. They're tough, uh, but they play very smart. I've said this all along. You know, I think the good teams that I've been a part of, the good teams that I've coached, they start to embody the personality of the head coach. And I think that this BYU team has embodied Kalani's personality. They they find a way to win. Um, they, they, they're very aggressive defensively. They create turnovers defensively. They put pressure on you that way. Uh, and then, and then, you know, staying remaining opportunistic offensively to, to create explosive plays and to score points. You mentioned the turnovers and BYU has been one of the best teams in takeaways and, and, and assuming it's high on the list every game, how much focus has there been and how critical will that aspect be in determining the outcome for Saturday? Well, it's huge. Um, you know, it, it's the number one stat in football that talks to winning and losing football games. And, um, and so it's always a point of emphasis of ours. This game now more than ever, it, it's heightened with it, with a team that uh, is on fire right now. I think they have 11 interceptions on the year. I think they've recovered four fumbles. Um, and so the fact that they're creating them uh, on defense and that they're taking care of the ball, you know, defensively or, or offensively is, is a huge factor for us. And I really think in the two losses that they had, that that's where their issues came is when they did turn the ball over. So uh, I think the ball is paramount here for sure. Your entire roster reads like an NFL depth chart, but I, I want to focus on the defense. 
Where does the defensive side of the ball stand right now in your mind? What's the state of your defense? Well, I like our defensive front. Um, you know, I, I think that that we're that we, we've got some good size. I think we play physical, and I think we play good football up front. Um, naturally, you know, we I mean, we pride ourselves on the depth that we have on the defensive side of the ball and our ability to play a lot of players. Um, you know, we, we may play upwards to thirty players. You know, twenty five players in the first half here Saturday on defense. So, when we can play a lot of people and we have confidence in them to do that, I think that bodes well for us. Not just early in the game, but I think that's helpful for us as we head into fourth quarters of games that our guys are fresh uh, and they're able to play good football late in the game when 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 we need to make those plays. Steve, you have earned and been blessed to be a part of some pretty big programs in college football throughout your career. When it comes to brands, Texas certainly right there, not to mention the support of the athletic department, over 100,000 in the stands for home games. What has this opportunity to lead the football program at Texas meant to you? And maybe how much of your time at BYU, because we're all a product of our experiences, how much of your time at BYU has has helped you throughout your career and, and implemented what you went through with where you were at? Well, I, I think one, it's, it's an honor. It's humbling, right. To think that, you know, I'm the head coach of the university of Texas, you know, regardless, you know, then, I mean, you know, I think about coach Brown, I think about coach Royal, I mean, coach, coach acres, there's been some great, great coaches here that have led championship teams, you know, you know, Heisman trophy winners, things of that nature. So, you know, that that's, that's humbling and, and it's an honor, but, but two, I think back to my time at BYU, a, the responsibility you have when you're in a position like this, like I was the quarterback at BYU, there's a responsibility. You're kind of the face of the program in that aspect. Uh, but I also look back to how coach Edwards conducted himself and, 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 and how much of a high regard people held him in because of the way he and miss Patty carried themselves and represented the represented BYU. Uh, and I, and I feel like I have that same responsibility here in that, you know, I'm leading young men in that the way they represent themselves starts with me. Um, but also the, the, the growth that they have is when they leave here, how do they continue to represent the University of Texas time and time again with the next class and the next class and the next class. And I think, you know, Coach Edwards is up there with the greatest of all time at doing that in how many years that he did do that at BYU. And, you know, I got a chance to be part of that. Um, but I, I don't take that lightly. I don't take my time at, at BYU lightly. And like I said, I'm surrounded by some great people that taught me a lot of, of life lessons that have helped me uh, to get to this point. And now I'm, I'm in position to kind of, you know, return that favor uh, for a lot of the young men that, that I'm, I get to be around every single day. Coach, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Uh, thank you for making time for us to do this today. I know I speak for a lot of BYU fans when I say that you brought a lot of joy to this fan base, and we are all proud that you will always be a Cougar. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. See you Saturday. That was Steve Sarkeesian, head coach of the Texas Longhorns, but uh, Cougar fans will always remember him as the quarterback for the BYU Cougars. An absolute pleasure to be able to talk with him, and he could not have been any more gracious. We will take one final break. Back to wrap things up, we'll also check in on that Oklahoma and Kansas game. Back with more Cougar pregame live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Tune to Cougar Pregame Live, brought to you by Mountain America on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, back to Jason Shepard. All right, before we get back to anything college football, we've got to make mention, in case you had not heard, the uh, Big 12 uh, Cross Country Championships were going on today in Ames, Iowa. BYU, obviously, year one in the Big 12. Well, year one and conference championship number one. Congratulations to the BYU women's cross country team champions of the Big 12. So congratulations to Diljeet Taylor and the entire women's cross country squad. Fantastic news in Ames today. All right, let's get you updated on some of the Big 12 games going on right now. We were talking earlier, uh, Hans and I, during the uh, Big 12 Blitz about number 6 Oklahoma at Kansas. Kansas actually, going into halftime, had a chance to tie this game up. There was one throw, I believe it was on third down, where uh, Jason Bean overthrew a wide-open receiver, which would have tied the game. They ended up settling 
for a field goal after getting the ball down inside the five. Uh, they are getting ready to start the second half. It is Oklahoma 21 and Kansas 17. So second half getting ready to start in Lawrence. Certainly one will be following. K-State continues to dominate Houston. Wildcats leading the Cougars in red 41-0 with under seven minutes to go in the fourth quarter. West Virginia has taken a commanding lead at UCF. The Mountaineers, who BYU will play next week in Morgantown, lead UCF 38-21 with nine minutes to go in the fourth quarter. Coming up at 1.30 Mountain Time, Iowa State will be at Baylor. And then at 6 o'clock Mountain Time in Stillwater, Oklahoma State will be hosting the Cincinnati Bearcats. All right, coming up next, it's the Zions Bank Cougar Pregame Coaches Show with Greg Rubel and Kalani Satake. You're listening to BYU Football on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. It's time to hear from the head coach of the BYU Cougars, Kalani Satake. This is the Cougar Pregame Coaches Show, presented by Zions Bank. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. The Cougar Pregame Coaches Show is also brought to you by Big O Tires. Stop by your locally owned and operated Big O Tires, the team you trust. Let's join Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Good afternoon, Cougar football fans. Welcome inside Darrell K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium in Austin, Texas. They call it DKR. This 100,000-seat venue celebrating its 100th season of football. As today, 7th-ranked Texas plays the 700th home game in its football history by welcoming in the BYU Cougars for the first and only time. These two teams will square off as Big 12 conference colleagues. I'm your play-by-play commentator, Greg Rubel. I'm joined in our broadcast booth by the big man, former BYU and NFL lineman Hans Olsen. And BYU Today plays on as big a stage as there is in college football. The mid-afternoon ABC TV slot, a top 10 opponent in one of the largest stadiums in the country. This is a big time football environment. And the challenge for the Cougars is to raise the level of their play to the intensity of the surroundings. Hans, BYU will have to be at its best to pass today's test. And they have been in the past here. You know, BYU's 2-1 and one in this stadium. They've had some wins here. They've had some success against Texas. They're 4-1 and one against Texas in the five games that they've played them. You go back to that 2014 game that we all talk about, the famous picture, Taysom Hill, 280 total yards, three touchdowns. He was spectacular. So, yeah, it's a big-time stage. But I'll tell you this, too, Greg. I, I know that when we were at Kansas there in Lawrence, we saw a big contingent of blue, but... I'm seeing a massive swath of blue forming off the right corner of this Texas stadium. That's as much blue as I've seen in the stadium. Looks pretty good right now, doesn't it? You yes, can even it does. see it down to your left as well in the uh, in the northwest corner of the stadium. A lot of BYU blue in this uh, predominantly burnt orange venue. It's, it, they're doing really well. BYU uh, showing up really well so far. This is as much as I think I've seen to this point when we're at this point in the pregame. That is a lot of BYU blue. And I do want to mention that the greatest center in BYU history, in my opinion, the guy that made Steve Sarkeesian famous, Larry Moore, he's in the stadium. I'm going to meet up with my teammate afterwards. Love him. Uh, He was part of that 96 Cotton Bowl team, and I think he's the most underrated offensive lineman in BYU history. Best offensive center that I've matched up against. He was also my teammate with the Indianapolis Colts. So he was there with NFL caliber, absolutely. He was there with the Colts with me for a time as well, and uh, just love him, and I love that the BYU former players are showing up. There's, I think there's a, a contingent about 15 or 20 guys that I know of that I played with or played just after me that are here. So everybody's showing up for this one, Greg. It is a big-time matchup, but, man, you can just feel the presence and the love of the BYU fans. After this break, we'll get the pregame words of BYU head coach Kalani Sitake as the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show continues for 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. My pregame chat with the coach is coming up next on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. The Cougar Pregame Coaches Show continues. Once again, here's Greg Rubel. 
We are coming to you from Daryl K. Royal, Texas Memorial Stadium in Austin, Texas, as Texas and BYU meet for the sixth time all time. BYU has won four of the preceding five get-togethers. Wins in 1987 and 1988, a loss in 2011, then wins in 2013 and 2014. The last one coming here in Austin when Taysom Hill introduced the hurdle, quote-unquote, into Cougar football lore. Time now for my pregame conversation with BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. It's brought to you by Zions Bank. For 150 years of helping you succeed, Zions Bank is for you. And today, Coach Itake talks about taking, uh, well, taking on one of the top teams in the country, 7th-ranked Texas, but a team with a challenge of its own to overcome today as Texas will start a backup quarterback, Malik Murphy, against BYU. The Cougs facing an understudy under center for a third straight week. Well, I mean, he's capable, obviously. We see him on film. He's a big-time recruit. Um, out of out of um, Sarah in, in California, and so he's uh, you know, and, and I know I know Sark and I know his staff. They'll get them ready. Um, but what we're hoping is just not the same type of performance that the TCU uh, Hoover had on us, and a lot of that uh, was his ability but also we made so many mistakes and uh, i think that's going to be the key here is us focusing on on our part rather than focusing on who's behind center for them and uh they have this is texas so you know they're going to have great depth at every position and that and if their head coach is a former quarterback you know he's going to have that room ready and so malik murphy arch manning doesn't matter who's behind the center they're going to be very capable not every quarterback goes 6'5", 238, uh, a guy like K.J. Jefferson does, and, and Malik Murphy does. Yeah, and, and, and uh, I don't think, I mean, he's got a really strong arm, and he's really accurate, and so we have to find ways to disrupt his timing and, and, and disrupt his throw. Um, but uh, I think handling the run game is going to be a big part because Jonathan Brooks is an amazing running back, and he and Baxter, those guys do a great job. And, um, you know, for... If for us, just keeping them, keeping them bottled up as much as can as we can will be good. Uh, them in space is very, was very scary. Yeah, another week, another great Big Twelve running back in Jonathan Brooks. He averages six point four yards carry. Yeah, and dynamic runner, and, and he can break tackles. He's got good size and great speed. Um, so you know, I think he's he's a great replacement for for Bijan leaving to the NFL, mm-hmm. and I think he's a next level guy too. They don't throw it to a lot of guys, but the guys they throw it to are very good. Worthy and Mitchell and Whittington at wide receiver, and Jatavian Sanders, one of the best tight ends in the country, too. Yeah, tough matchups. I mean, these guys are big and they're 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 long and they're fast, and they can uh, they have great ball skills. But I think it's the little things that they do. I think they're well coached, so they block well downfield, and they can hurt you with the short throws. They can hurt you with the with the deep ones. So uh, it's a great matchup for us, and and then we'll have to be on top of it with our defensive backfield. What impresses you about the t- uh, Texas defense coming into this one? Yeah, the thing that sticks out the most is their front, the front uh, line, the D line specifically, and then you look at from there, everything else is, is complements uh, what happens up front. They're very disruptive, very strong up front, and then they go, they can go too deep, three deep. I mean, they're they're very deep in, in that position, but a very very talented uh, linebacking group and then uh, their DBs those guys can run they cover ground um, and so it's a tough defense Uh, I I think uh, it jumps out on film when you see it and we got to be ready for this where do you hope to attack that Texas defense with your group today? Well, I think we can do what, what, what as long as we're assignment sound, I, I feel good about what we do. And, and it's not about us <laughs> establishing um, our will. It's just doing, just executing whatever we have called. It doesn't matter if it's a run, pass, whatever type of pass or type of run. It's just everybody doing their job, Every, all 11 guys on the field doing their job. And, and when we're clicking like that, I, I don't think it really matters. Last week, Aiden Robbins kind of took things over in the backfield in the fourth quarter against Texas Tech. Uh, L.J. Martin got banged up in that game? Yeah, he did. And, and uh, doesn't look good. We'll see it pregame, but it uh, but doesn't look like he's going to be available. Uh, so Aiden will be available, ready to go. And then, um, you know, he and Miles and, and Dion had great practice this week. L.J. practice, um, we just – it's very similar to what we had Cody the last couple of weeks. It's just kind of – deciding whether or not we want to put him in harm's way and if we're risking uh, more injury on top of what he's got already. How did Aiden Robbins look to you, though, in, in, in the time he had last week? That's the Aiden I remember. You know, that's the one that we had in, in, the, in fall camp, and it's good to get him healthy and 100%. And I think had we not made that decision and, and pushed him along, he, he would have made himself uh, – he's willing to work hard and play for the team, but uh, he would have put himself in a deeper, a, a deeper position of trying to climb back to health. Uh, we took some time off, gave him a, a chance to be 100%. And when he's 100%, he's a tough, tough guy to bring down. Probably go without uh, Keanu today? Yeah, Kibo, uh, unfortunately, that, that injury has been lingering a little bit longer, so he's not going to be able to go. But uh, we have Cody still and, and Darius and 
uh, Chase and Keelan Parker and the rest of the group. We'll give some guys, uh, other guys, an opportunity to make more plays. How's your O-line looking? Uh, Kingsley's been the only guy that's really started every spot or every game at the same spot this year. Yeah, Kingsley and, and Connor have been very uh, stable for what we're doing. But, um, you know, we have some guys that are a little banged up. We'll see we mess around with the, with the rotation a little bit. But, um, you know, we, we feel good about eight to nine guys that can play in this game, and, and, and we'll have to rely on those guys with this defensive front. BYU's got a good history against this Texas program. Some good vibes that way. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I got the coach chase him, but I wasn't here when he made those plays, and I, I watched them. And so, obviously, uh, you know, we've, teams have been here before and have won. Um, this is a, a, a ranked team in the top ten. Uh, a lot of people still have them in, in contention for the playoffs. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough matchup. We've gone against top teams before in the top ten and been on the road before. So I, th- I like the plan that we've had. My focus is just us playing at our best. And, and if we can get that done and play to our potential, then uh, then we'll see what, what happens at the end, see what the result looks like. All right, Kalani, good luck toward that end, and we'll talk to you post-game. Thank you. Here we go. Go Cougs. Thank you. That is BYU head coach Kalani Sitake. And this has been the Zions Bank Cougar pregame coaches show. Time now for today's Ford Keys to the Game. They're presented by your local Ford stores. BYU football is built Ford proud. Hans Olsen, what are your keys for today's game? BYU in Texas. All right, let's start with number one, Greg. You and I talked about this in the drive over. BYU has to do to Jonathan Brooks what they did to Taj Brooks last week against Texas Tech. They've got to keep him under his season averages. BYU has seen four fantastic running backs in the last few weeks. Taj Brooks, Imani Bailey, Devin Neal, Corey Kiner, and now Jonathan Brooks. Top running backs in the country, right across the board. You kept every one of those guys underneath their season average in rushing yards and rush per carry. So you now have to do that against Jonathan Brooks. He averages 118 per game. You got to keep him at that 100 or under. He a- averages 6.5 yards per carry, which is second only to Devin Neal, who averages 7.3. Keep him under his yards per carry and keep him under that season yard average. That is um, key number one. Number two, Houston did a great job of targeting routes that were covered by Texas linebackers. Houston is getting blown out right now, but they put this Texas team to the test last week. So that gives you some hope. And how did they do it? Well, they found three different receivers for 80-plus yards. They found four different receivers for 70-plus yards. They distributed the ball. They used their tight end in mismatch with the star backer, with the jack backer. But they did a lot of their work in the quick slants and in the middle of the field, the post and the seam work. And they did it against the Jacks or the star linebackers and just finding those mismatches. So Aaron Roderick and Fessy Sataki need to do that well. And by the way, it's gone final. Houston getting shut out against Kansas State. 41-0 in Manhattan today. So Houston drops to 1-4 and four in Big 12 play. K-State goes to 4-1. and one. K-State's arguably playing the best ball of anyone right now in the Big 12. Well, and that Houston team that just put a big goose egg up against Kansas State, they had nearly 400 yards passing last week. Against Texas. Against Texas. They scored 24. Against this defense, against yeah. this backfield. So the way they did it too, Greg, I mean, they definitely did attack the corners, but they really did find those backers in different coverages because you do lock Jack or you do lock Star on with tight ends. So what I'd like to see is a Tavate Ase with maybe two or three receptions. I'd like to see a Parker Kingston with three or four receptions. Spread it out, find those mismatches, and take advantage of it. And we know that Aaron Roderick and Fessy Sataki are very capable of that. We've seen it before, and they can do it again. Key number three. Number three, and this is a big one. How many times have you heard me mention special teams to this point in our time on air together? A lot. It, this one is big. It is bigger than any game to this point. Texas does a lot of things in their special teams to make it really difficult for the opponent. Against Oklahoma, they had a 32-yard fake punt. They were on their own 32-yard line, and they ran a fake punt, and it was successful in conversion. They also blocked a punt in Oklahoma's end zone, recovered it for a touchdown. We've seen special teams against Houston. We've seen their special teams be well-coached, disciplined, and make plays. BYU special teams won the battle last week against Texas Tech. They lost the battle the week before against TCU. They have to win the special teams battle. Kelly Popinga, 
Jan Jorgensen, the special teams gurus and crews, whether it's your field goal kicking with Farron or it's your punting with Rico, it has to win the battle in the third phase of the game today. Those are the Ford keys to the game coming up next. The Cougar kickoff show live from the Lone Star State on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. We're getting closer to kickoff of BYU football. You're tuned to the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show. Ken Garf, we hear you. The Cougar Kickoff Show is also brought to you by Bailey's. We move with you every step of the way since 1952. Also brought to you by BYU Creamery, the classic BYU tradition. Have a scoop today. Now, let's head live to the All-Pro Capital broadcast booth. Alongside Hans Olsen, here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Let's pause 10 seconds for station identification on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is BYU Radio on KBYU FM HD2 Provo. You are listening to BYU Football on BYU Radio. Good afternoon once again, Cougar Nation. We welcome you back inside Daryl K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium in Austin, Texas. This afternoon, number seven, Texas, welcoming the BYU Cougars. BYU coming in 5-2, and 2-2 two, two and two in the Big 12. Longhorns 6 and 1, 3 and 1 in league play. The Cougs are one win away from bowl eligibility. Texas has its eyes on a potential rematch with Oklahoma in the Big 12 title game, perhaps a spot in the college football playoff. This is the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show presented by Ken Garf. Whatever your vehicle needs are, go to kengarf.com. Ken Garf, we hear you. Greg Rubel, Hans Olsen, coming to you from our All Pro Capital broadcast booth. Former BYU wide receiver Mitchell Jurgens on the sidelines and in the Zions Bank end zone for 150 years of helping you succeed. Zions Bank is for you. Our scoreboard host back in Provo is Jason Shepard, booth engineers Ben and Lily Warner, spotter Jake Murphy, statistician Ralph Sokolowski, coordinating producer is Terry South, control board operators Seth Larson, Derek Dungan, and Ethan Arkell. Studio editor is James Finlayson. Today's stats interns are Tam- Talmadge Hilton and Kendall Ruth. You are joining us on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Well, BYU is a funky 5-2. The Cougars have some numbers that don't necessarily equate to five wins in seven games. BYU ranks bottom nationally, bottom 10 nationally in yardage, bottom 10 in first downs, bottom 10 in third down conversion percentage, bottom half of the country in scoring, bottom five in rushing, sub 100 in possession time, third down defense is bottom 30, bottom five in sacks and tackles for loss. So how is BYU one win away from bowl eligibility after only seven games? It comes down to three key areas. Turnover margin, red zone efficiency, and field position. BYU's top 30 nationally in all three areas. Simply put, BYU is not hurting itself and is really helping itself when it gets the chance. The chance to capitalize on sudden change takeaways, the chance to score inside the 20, and the chance to flip the field. Hands, BYU is not playing perfect football. But BYU is playing winning football. They are. They're playing winning football. Steve Sarkeesian is a master of preparation. And he knows the exact same thing. He knows that turnovers last week just destroyed Texas Tech. And he knows that BYU is leading in the country in takeaways. I think it's 16 takeaways on the year. Which is four nationally. Which is fantastic what they're doing. So so Sarkeesian's going to go to his young freshman quarterback that's getting his first start. He's going to tell him. We don't make dumb decisions in the throw game, and we don't put the ball on the ground. Texas has only fumbled the ball four times this year, so they don't put the ball on the ground a lot. So what I'm saying is BYU is going to have to impose their will. They're going to have to force Texas into things they really haven't done to this point. You also mentioned red zone efficiency. Now, this is crazy with Texas. They're really tough defensively in the red zone. They've allowed 19 trips into the red zone from their opponents. They have only given up six touchdowns in the red zone. Three through the passing game, three through the running game. It is very difficult to score on Texas when you're inside the 20. But BYU has been efficient. They've been good at it. So what I'm saying, Greg, is we've got some crossroads here because Texas is very good in the areas that BYU has won games in. 
And BYU's got to win those areas in order to win this game. So we'll see who gives first. Let's take a look now at this week's E-Assist player to watch for BYU. It's brought to you by the E-Assist Dental Health Education Foundation, reminding you that dental cleanings are essential for your health. Hands, who's your BYU player to watch this afternoon here in Austin? Well, it's my dude, Siale Acera. He's filled in for Ben Bywater, and you're going to see a rotation of him and Harrison Taggart. But I feel like Siale Acera is going to be really big in this game. I actually released a video earlier in the week showing what Texas does as a staple and what Jonathan Brooks is able to do in the run game. Knowing what I know about Texas and their offensive line and their blocking schemes, as that second line of defense, specifically the guy that's going to be patrolling from tackle to tackle, Siali has to be able to engage those blocks, take them on, shed them, and he's got to be in those run lanes. Siali Serra has to be one of the top two in tackles today, and he has got to be dominant at the point of attack. He can't take the blocks on five yards past the line of scrimmage. He has to get up and take those blocks on at two yards past the line of scrimmage, and he has to win. He has to defeat those to keep Jonathan Brooks below his season average. He's got to get into the kitchen and start doing some dishes. Yeah, he's got to start doing dishes, man. (laughs) There's no question. We'll have more of the Ken Garf Kruger kickoff show after this short timeout. But first, a reminder to go to BigOtires.com and make an appointment at one of 50 locally owned and operated Utah locations. Big O Tires, the team you trust. Pre-game coverage from Austin, Texas continues right after this on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. This is the Ken Garf Cougar kickoff show. Let's get back to Hans Olsen and the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. We've got BYU in Texas coming up just after the bottom of the hour here at Darrell K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium. Capacity 100,000 to 119. UT has drawn 100,000 or more to this venue 36 times all time, including seven of its last nine home games. And the storyline for a third straight week is BYU facing a backup quarterback two weeks ago. BYU got the number two Josh Hoover at TCU, and he carved up the Cougars in a blowout win for the Horned Frogs. Last week, BYU got the number three in Jake Strong versus Texas Tech, and he struggled in BYU's comfortable win over the Red Raiders in Provo. Now today, BYU faces second stringer Malik Murphy with Quinn Ewers sidelined. Murphy, 6'5", 238-pound redshirt freshman, did not play at all last year has gotten into four games this season. And Steve Sarkeesian believes that BYU D.C. J. Hill will show Murphy some things that he may not have seen on tape to this point. We haven't seen much from Murphy, but what have you seen from Murphy's tape, and how do you expect BYU to play him? Well, I'd love the question, and I think that we have a lot to learn, and we have a lot to see because it's just pretty unknown. You know, we were sitting up here, Greg, you and I were watching Malik throw the ball around a little bit in warm-ups, and you could see he's got a powerhouse of an arm. We were talking with Craig, who is the play-by-play voice for the Texas Longhorns, and he said that the guy can absolutely launch it. It's just been wildly untested to this point, and the fact of the unknown makes me a little bit nervous about this kid. I just sent the picture out of him. You and I were looking at it. He's just built like a Greek god. He's chiseled out of granite. He stands 6'5". He's 245 pounds. He's going to be hard to bring down. But he might go out there and make some mistakes as well. He's seen some new coverages and some new defensive uh, techniques. And so those things are going to look different and probably a little bit foreign to him. Jay Hill is a master of making quarterbacks see something and then put something else in front of him. So big-time coordinating job from Jay Hill this evening for BYU to have a chance in this. Now, if Malik Murphy were to struggle today and Steve Sarkeesian felt a change needed to be made at any point, uh, Arch Manning, yes, Arch Manning is waiting in the wings. Time now for today's Hyatt Place Comfort Zone feature at Hyatt Place Provo. Your convenience and comfort will always be our highest priority. And last week against Texas Tech, BYU looked a little more comfortable in the run game. The Cougars ran it 30 times for a season-high 150 yards in the Kalani Sitake era. BYU is now 46-9 and nine, and on a five-game win streak when rushing for 150 or more. L.J. Martin ran it 10 times for 90 yards. That's the good news. The bad news is, on one of his last carries, he was banged up and was shut down for the night. And although he did warm up today, 
Kalani Sitake telling us in pregame that it was unlikely that LJ plays today. That would bring it to Aiden Robbins. He ran it 16 times last week to lead BYU, and he ran hard. He had the game ceiling 13-yard grinder on a third down and 13 late. Hans, you liked the way that the offensive line played. Aaron Roderick picked Paul Miley and Waylon Lapuajo as his offensive players of the game against Texas Tech, and you certainly liked the way Aiden ran. Yeah, I did. I liked it all. I really did. I thought that the offensive line showed up, and, and man, what a what a huge boost to get that type of run ability out of those guys last week against Texas Tech. You could feel it, Greg. When we were in the studio and we were calling that thing, we could feel the energy in the booth just coming from the run game. There's been a couple of things that I've really liked, and, and I know that LJ may not get the looks in this game, so maybe you run it with Miles Davis. But one thing I really like, I like the option look. Now, Keaton Slovis, I think Keaton Slovis can do a, a better job on the option look of taking it to the point to making the defender commit. He's got to make that defender, that outside defender, commit to him before he pitches it. But that option attack with Miles Davis or that option, option attack uh, with Aiden Robbins could be very effective. It, it really has worked well. And it would have gone for big yardage against TCU if there wasn't a missed block on the outside. So every time we've seen that option look, it's it's gotten some good yards. I just want to see Keaton keep it a little bit longer and maybe even hold it, maybe even fake the pitch and go get eight on a critical third and eight, something like that. And one thing you're not seeing from BYU, and you kind of knew you weren't going to see it, but uh, there, there's really no quarterback run threat for BYU right now, and it is making BYU a little easier to defend. In Aaron Roderick's previous seasons with Zach Wilson, Jaron Hall, you always had that threat. Let's pause now to hear our national anthem here at DKR. on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. You're listening to the Ken Garf Cougar Kickoff Show on the new skin, BYU Sports Network. Now, let's head live to the All-Pro Capital broadcast booth. Alongside Hens Olsen, here's the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel. Getting you set for BYU in Texas, in Austin on a muggy Saturday afternoon. 84 degrees right now and a chance.